Okay. Uh, who's never been to the Three Jewels before? One, two, three, four. Good. I can't count. There's really three. I said that for everybody to feel better. Um, welcome to the Three Jewels. Welcome to a special place. And I want to invite you uh, today uh, to allow yourself for the next two hours to step into a world that's completely yours, uniquely yours, the most perfect part of who you are and the most perfect part of who you could be. Um, we're going to do, we're starting today, course four of an 18 course incredible presentation of how the world operates and how perception exists and what reality is and what causes suffering and what causes happiness. And, and so we're, we're fortunate enough to get a lineage that's been on the planet for 2,500 years of beings thinking about this stuff, experiencing this stuff, and for some reason we get to be in a room to talk about these things for two hours. There is no reason to talk about these things for two hours other than transforming something in you. So I'm going to invite you to please challenge yourself to allow whatever old life, past life you have that you want to get rid of and whatever future life you want to step into today to allow yourself two hours to try that, taste that, think in that way, listen in that way, ask in that way, be in that way. Two hours for today and then next week and then next week. And hopefully we can say goodbye to our past life <laughs> and say hello to our future life. Yeah, but to do that, let's uh, get the mind from the normal or the old way of being into a neutral zone so we can take in a whole new way of being. That's my invitation to you. To do that, we're going to do a quick meditation. Anybody here never meditated before? I'm the only one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Properly. <laughs> so t take a comfortably comfortable seated position. Make sure your cell phones are off. If you're too hot. We can change that later. And so, before meditating, we're going to ask whatever that thing is that allows in you to get a realization. We've all had them to some degree in life. You thought life was happening this way, and something informed you that it was happening a different way, and that made all the difference. We do it as children, we do it as teenagers, we do it as adults. Something happens in us that communicates to us the way the world could really be and sometimes we step into that that thing that allows you to have that realization we're going to call the teacher so i'm going to ask you to imagine a perfect universe in your mind and offer it to that thing your teacher your personal teacher in exchange for their presence here today in, in you so to do that in tibetan we do a whole bunch of blah blah you just have to imagine a perfect universe and then imagine that force that gives you knowledge and offer it to them in exchange for perfect experience. Sashi Puki Jishin Metotram Viralinjin Indegam Padi Sangay, 
position your back should be straight your vertebrae stacked one on top of the other like golden coins your base should be firm your eyes sharp but not tightly your shoulders level with the ground as is your chin and just breathe see if you can bring your mind to the sensation of the breath Observe it as it enters and exits your nostrils. See if you can feel a difference in the temperature on the exit and on the entry. Before we go into meditation, do one last scan of your body. Begin at the base. See if there's any tension in your legs, hips, in your tummy just a little bit, not too much, just enough to give you firmness there. It supports your lower back. While breathing. Move up your torso. Remove any tension, feel your muscles and your shoulders relaxing. You're not slouching forward or backwards too much. Your chin is tucked in a little just to allow your head to sit on your neck properly without moving side to side or back and forth. Finally, scan your face, remove any tension from your brow. The sides of your lips should be slightly curved in a tiny smile that opens up your nostrils. And your eyelids are also beautifully relaxed. Press your mind tightly against your breath. Your mind is your breath exiting and entering your nostril. See if you can follow that air in and out of your nostrils. Now press your mind against the very tip of your nose. See how fine you can find the hairs at the very tip of your nostrils moving with the air flow. Now invite your teacher to please come Whatever that thing is, it could be a real person, an imaginary being. Whoever brings these realizations to you the most, ask them please to come. 
and sit cross-legged in front of you, facing you, your knees almost touching. As soon as you imagine it, they come. It is just you and them. Imagine their presence. If you can't visualize them, feel their presence like a gravity in front of you. Real 3D thing in front of you. If you've practiced this before, see if you can imagine their body made of light, the thing inside that body you imagine. <coughs> and together you breathe in synchronicity. Feel happy that they've come. Offer them something beautiful that you experienced in the last 24 hours. Maybe you saw the most beautiful sunrise. You felt the warmth of the sun on your skin and it felt lovely. See if you can offer that to them. Something beautiful. They can tell what you're thinking and there's a happiness that grows between both of you. About their qualities now, what makes them special to you? What's something that they've got highly developed that you aspire towards? Maybe it's their kindness. Maybe it's a type of wisdom. See if you can appreciate that in them. appreciation and love for that quality they possess. Again, they can see and feel what you're thinking and experiencing and that lets you go a little bit deeper now. Now you're going to review, I guess, your behavior for the last 12 to 24 hours and see what's one thing in your day that that you're not too proud of that brought some ha unhappiness to this world maybe you were angry at someone or maybe you were impatient maybe you had quite a negative thought about somebody who might not have been as deserving of it as you thought see if you can look at that thing that brought unhappiness realize that it brought you the opposite of what you seek and feel some kind of regret for having that experience in your life. Doing this begins to clean it up. It's removed slightly from the bank of pressure in your mind, preoccupation with these things in your mind. Look for it. You imagine yourself without having that thing in your life you realize you had it in your life and you feel some kind of regret and a wish to not do it again maybe once or maybe the next opportunity you won't get angry you promise yourself you'll try as the teacher in front of you realizes that effort something beautiful turns on in your heart and theirs so now you, you think of the opposite. You think in the last 24 hours, what's the most enlightened thing you actually did? What beauty did you bring into your world? What wisdom and what love? Of the specific moment where you did something good. Made you and others happy here. Just enjoy the feeling of that thing. Be happy that you've got an aspect of you that brings goodness into your world and makes others happy. Spend some time imagining that it is possible to have that experience all the time. Really 
you dive in, allow yourself to enjoy a good state of being like the one you have. Enjoy. And as you do, realize that in this very room, there are some 20 or 30 people imagining the same thing, each of them having done a goodness brought some happiness, working towards a more fulfilling experience of this world. Happy for them. And find joy in other people's goodness. So now look at your teacher again and ask them please to stay and always teach you. Whatever that thing that turns on in you that responds to them, ask them to please always be there. And they look at you and they agree and smile. Now imagine them as they do that, begin to rise up and float a little bit higher. And they turn and face the same direction you're facing. They begin to shrink down to the small size of a thumb. And they rest just above the crown of your head, very lightly, just, just before touching you, they sit there. They a little, but they're powerfully there. All their wisdom and all their love. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you for doing that. Welcome to ACI 4, Asian Classics Institute, fourth course, <coughs> Proof of Future Lives. Uh, I have to do the disclaimer. My name is Hector Marcel Geronimo Ochoa Peralta de Figurili de Malacaria II. <laughs> <laughs> I was born when I was very young. <laughs> you can tell who's not been in these classes before, right? <laughs> I do that at the beginning of every course because it's my favorite joke. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Hi. Hi. So, like I said earlier, uh, we're going to spend some time together. Today it's two hours. Um, if you come to all the classes, there will be 12 courses, 12 classes, presenting a whole experiential and, physic, uh, and psychological view of the world that we are not familiar with in the West. So imagine that uh, somehow this room gets to sit on top of the Himalayas and observes Tibet for the last thousand years. And we get a glimpse at what that is. And then hopefully get to apply it to our everyday. Insights and wisdoms on being. I hope that uh, some of these things land deep inside of you and that you can have a transformative experience today of your world to make it a happier, more meaningful, more complete experience of living. My disclaimer is uh, I'm just some guy who was fortunate enough to meet um, a whole series of circumstances that brought me to study these things with an incredible teacher. It wasn't without fighting and I think after 17 years of studying with this teacher I'm beginning to understand what it's all about. <laughs> so I hopefully uh, can share some of those things with you. So, there's a whole bunch of things I want to talk about before we get into the class today. Um, there's going to be many classes in each class. As many classes as there are people here. For each one of you, you can have a completely different experience of the words that are blah blah. They're not my words. My job is not to add any of my uh, 
of my, of my stuff into it because it'll probably turn it bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so these things have been tried and tested. These are ex these are realizations of a being called the Buddha who passed them on to a series of people and this tradition comes verbally and in written form commentaries and decoding coding and decoding written word and a teacher student explanation so that part I'll do to try and bring context of today into these wisdoms but the wisdoms the teachings I'm going to transmit as I learned them with the same precision as 2,500 years of unbroken lineage all the way back to the Buddha. So for you guys to know a little bit about uh, my teacher, Holy Geshe Michael Roach, the first Westerner to receive, the first American to receive the Geshe degree, he corrects me every time. Yeah, because there is another Westerner from Switzerland who has this thing going. Anyway. <laughs> Are they friends? Or? Mm. <laughs> They're good friends now. Um, but the, and so, so what I'm trying to say to you is that the, the, the stuff that's coming to you uh, has come through an unbroken lineage of teacher-student relationship and written down in these things called sutras and commentaries. We'll get into the nitty-gritty of some of these ideas to a way that's unprecedented in the West. We don't get to study these things to this degree. And in that respect, in that regard, we are uniquely fortunate. So we have the Western way of perceiving the world. We get taught that through life. We think our reality is what we learn. We have these prejudices. You get to, s to learn another set of prejudices. <laughs> and then you, you're more equipped holistically to look at your universe. So there will be several classes. The classes are as many as there are people in the room, me included. And then within those classes, I'll, I want to see if you can catch that there are two levels of understanding. There'll be the nominal level of understanding, some logic explaining some ideas. And then there's some ultimate meaning behind all these things. The stuff that turns on in you, the experience that's sort of magic for some. Sometimes it's rejection and sometimes it's attraction of a unstoppable way. I hope that happens to you in some degree. So listen with new ears and, and think with a new mind if you can. Allow yourself two hours to be special. Remind yourself these two hours. Can I listen with a state of mind that is uniquely new for me? That elevates me. That allows me to find meaning and happiness in a world that's in turmoil. A world where things don't work the way we want them to and we fight and run away from things we don't like and we desperately run towards things we like and then we get them and then we want more or we want another thing and then another and another and another. And that way of being is just being like that on this planet for as long as man has been here. And you can, I mean, we will continue, we're sort of forced to be in that mode. We're saying there's a different reality happening here. So I hope you listen to that. Um, and all levels are available to you. Sometimes you might be tired coming here going, oh, it's hard or whatever. It's your responsibility to go, let me just turn on that hearer, that interpreter that has got a heightened perspective. I invite you to do that. Two hours. And it's the GIGO principle, you know, good in, good out. You experience a beautiful world. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> that's it. You know, that's the whole teaching. So this is habituating ultimate goodness for you. In, So you can perceive a world of ultimate beauty. That's it. This is a specific route to it. There are many routes. So I invite you to, to do that. And then uh, there's two metaphors here I want to invite you to. The first metaphor is what I said earlier. The whole... The whole course is proof of future lives. And it's sort of a trick. It's not really what the course is about. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sexy Western idea. Oh, I wonder what that is. You know? <laughs> but really, there, re there isn't a need in Eastern thinking to prove <coughs> past lives or future lives. It's a prejudice over there. 
They believe it. So the only reason this is a course is because it uses the fundamentals of logic and perception that are true courses, deep uh, subjects in Eastern philosophy. And using logic, perception and these deep subjects, the Buddhists about 1500 years ago used that logic and perception and understanding to prove past and future lives to a clan uh, in India who had very similar ideas to us in the West about this, you just die and nothing happens. That's it, you're finished, goodbye, see you later. You know, and so the Buddhists tried in, in, to put forward the best arguments they could to try and explain their prejudice that something happens, something continues beyond death. So I, the metaphor that we're going to be talking about the proof of future lives, like what, what is it logically that can prove that, and we'll do that today, not today, in this course, is only really used, and you'll discover it as I pull out the material, it was only ever used in the explanation of Buddhist logic. Does that make sense? We'll get to it. So this, you'll learn that, and that's important. It'll give you power in the planet to explain your position about things, logic, Eastern logic. How, how you define definitions is a topic, which is weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the metaphor here, I was thinking, you know, how can you use this stuff today? Because this stuff you can use. You can use to turn on your life. And so I challenge you to pick one thing in your life for the next 12 weeks. One thing that you wish was a past life. <laughs> that you don't want in your life anymore. <laughs> Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's being broke all the time. Maybe it's not finding the right partner. Yeah? Maybe it's losing your hair. No, don't do that. <laughs> it doesn't work. No. <laughs> Pick one thing inside of you you wish was a past life for you. And see, I mean, it's an experiment. I'm just saying it gives you an opportunity to grab some of these wisdoms and apply it today in the meditations that we do here, in the homeworks that I invite you to do in the thinking that you should do between classes as you take your trains to work and you eat your meals and you lay your heads in your pillows and your mind will be going, it's challenging the ideas I'll present, hopefully. But if you have a specific goal to challenge it too, let's say I don't want to get angry anymore. How come I get angry all the time or jealous all the time or frustrated all the time? Or I easily fall in love again and again. You know? <laughs> Maybe you pick one of those things to, to do the metaphor of past and future lives. 12 courses, 12 times 2, 24 hours. Mm. One entire day where your mind can have a concentrated focus on who you truly want to become. It's possible. We're a changing thing. Da, 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 da. So this morning in the shower, that's what I'm supposed to tell you. <laughs> this morning in the shower. <laughs> You know, I want to give you a taste of how in this class you could come in contact with some of the magic. So you'll get all the story and all the whatever. But if you're brave enough, and if you're vulnerable enough, or if you've studied enough, maybe you'll begin to realize that there are other things at play that give you these realizations and insights. We call them the teacher, right? Uh, and so this morning, these two ideas popped into my mind. When I was a young kid, Somebody taught me that my external world was only a reflection of my mind. Now it means a completely different thing. But back then it meant if I didn't clean my room, I had a dirty mind. <laughs> that's, all, that's all it meant <laughs> right, as a kid. I'm like, oh, my, I have a messy room. I have a messy mind. And somehow I wanted to have an organized mind. So I fixed my room, you know. But I was very fortunate, this lady taught me that, and she wasn't my mom, and, and it stuck with me. Why did that stick with me and not with my brother, who's a messy kid? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's something that comes to you in life and turns on. So that idea stayed throughout my life, and somehow, in, in my understanding of how things work, produced and enabled me to enter these teachings and get way deeper insights about that. The reality that there is nothing else in your world, in your experience. There's no messy room other than the one in your mind. 
Our minds, let's take it from the Western perspective, the brain is locked in darkness inside this thing. There's no light that goes in there. It's bone. And it's like a dice. It's a little black box. And inside that box is receptors. And it looks through the windows of the pinholes in each of the senses. Yeah? So the brain can't see the outside world. It can only get the electrical signals sent by the prejudice of a limited perception here. There's no idea of what's really out there. We're living in here all the time. Completely, utterly, all the time. Nothing you hear, nothing you see, nothing you touch, nothing you taste is ever out there. Every single thing you perceive is only ever in here. Wow. I, I couldn't have gotten that had I, my mum told me not to clean my room. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the second piece that I, someone taught me early on. And I was very fortunate because those two things for me became the magic that got turned on when I got to meet a teacher. Holy Geshe Michael Roach. And I say holy, I'm not a religious person. I say holy because I don't think I ever met another creature on the planet who I could not refute from my experience of having complete and utter understanding of how life works. And had love and wisdom and happiness and a complete explanation that stamped over my every reality and no fighting could resist it. So then I was interested to know, you know, very selfishly, how did you figure all that out? So I started figuring it out. So what I'm saying to you is that you have available to you the opportunity to hear this and any other teaching or this or any other experience as complete magical play inside of you that turns on a magnificent life experience complete wisdom and knowledge and it's just there it's it's just there so give yourself two hours please a day just listen with the most amazing opportunity and you will find that's it that's the that's the pitch cool we did that we did that <laughs> any questions cool let's get into it who here completed the first Three courses. ACI one, ACI two, ACI three. Define complete. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Complete. Okay, who attended any of the classes of ACI one, two, and three together? That's nice. That's that's good. So these people have an advantage over the other people, right? Insofar as there is a prerequisite to understanding some of the words I'll share with you today, but it's not necessary to understand the concepts in this course, but it helps a lot. So I'll cover very high level. The first course, Asian Classics Institute Course 1, covers this book called Steps on the Path. And everyone's quiet and shy all of a sudden. Come on. Three principles. The three principal paths. Great. So what the hell is that? Right? So the three principal paths are just the ultimate ideas, the ultimate three states of mind required to reach enlightenment. Really. Yeah, there's three core principal states of mind that one needs to cultivate to achieve this thing called Nirvana Buddhahood. And the first one is this idea of renunciation. And it doesn't mean give away your money. It's deeper than that. So when you get that, it just means you're sick and tired of things not working. And you then want to figure out why and how things work. So the first thing is renunciation. You realize that the boyfriend breakups, the money problems, the job not satisfaction, the hair falling out, blah, 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 all these things that you continue to bump against, they just don't work. They don't give you happiness. They do for a little bit and then they blur. Oh, you thought you were going to get happiness and you didn't. And you realize that there's something else behind there. 
So then you, you get an insight into the human state of being. And if you get that, you get this charge about you that says, ah, renunciation. Argh. Yeah? <laughs> Don't want that to be that way. And hopefully that, if you just look like a millisecond around you, you should begin to get the second state of mind, which is bodhicitta, right? Which just means, what, what's the definition of bodhicitta? Let's have a look. Yeah, so then you realize life is crap and you want to figure it out. And then you have the second thought, which is, I want to get completely free from this suffering. And I, it's not just for me, because if I figure it out, the seven billion humans also experiencing what I've experienced, they might not be realizing it like I realize it. So if I can figure it out, I can help my mom, I can help my dad, I can help my brother, my lover, my sister, my friend, my neighbor, also figure it out. If I can remove that suffering from me, then I've found a way to stop that cycle that brings me unhappiness. Today, in this world, not in some fancy heaven. Now, I can reach the state of enlightenment, reach nirvana with bodhicitta, yeah? for the sake of everybody else. For me and everybody else. Me as the experiment, everybody else as the beneficiary. <laughs> <Yeah>? <laughs> That's it. That's the second core state of mind. So you walk around the planet developing that state of mind. And the third state of mind is? Correct view. Correct view. I found that so painful, uh, authoritative. Mm. Correct view. I was incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is a little. Honestly, it's a little bit like that. That's incorrect. <laughs> I was wrong? <laughs> anyway, so correct view. What this means is this very crucial idea of emptiness. Emptiness meaning there is nothing in the stuff we interact with that belongs to that stuff. It is empty of having any quality to make you happy or unhappy from the stuff side. That stuff out there that I will desperately want can never make me happy. There is nothing in it. It is empty of that quality. That unattractive object that I want to run away from because it makes me unhappy, there's nothing in it that makes me unhappy. Not from its own side. It gets filtered through my things. It gets perceived and upon whatever got filtered, whatever signal came in, my, my mind forcibly put upon it karma, put upon it a thing. The, this is the highest <coughs> wisdom, the highest realization of all reality, the idea of emptiness. It's a complex subject. We cover it in these 12 courses a little bit. But it's also so simple, we miss it. It's so simple, we miss it. Because if there was any quality inside a thing that always produced that reaction, it must produce it for every single thing that interacts with it. Yeah? If... Do you want some water? <laughs> I thought this was your first class. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> He's my friend Geekers, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I was just trying to make it. So there's nothing in the thing. And that, that possesses a quality that forces your response, which has massive implications. Every time you got angry, you never got angry at a thing other than you, that, than your perception of that thing. Every time you got a wisdom, every time you got an understanding, it wasn't out there with that teacher like we pretend here. Yeah? It was only ever in you. Forced upon you. It functions as if it's out there and that's why we play with this ritual of bowing to the teacher and doing all these things. It functions like it's out there. It's not, it can't be out there. Otherwise everybody without exception must experience that teacher like you do. That realization, that hatred, that thing. If it's coming out there like particles at you, every single thing, 
experiencing those particles must respond in the same way. The idea of emptiness is crucial to, to this uh, understanding of how your world can transform in a millisecond from complete suffering <coughs> to complete bliss and wisdom. If things were not empty, if they were not blank of those qualities, they would be fixed, meaning never changing. Meaning, you would always be angry, always be forced to be angry, stuck in angry and unable to change from angry, ever. Not changing. The fact that things change means they don't possess that quality. Deep subject, beautiful, all-encompassing, eye-opening possibility of a magnificent world and a crappy world. Both are possible, depending on how you manipulate your matrix. That was Asian Classics Institute Course 1. Thank you for the review. <laughs> Asian Classics Institute Course 2 was called Buddhist Refuge. Do you remember what that meant? Okay, someone? What's refuge? Well, refuge is to seek protection from something. Yeah. And Buddhist Refuge is to, to seek protection in the ultimate idea of emptiness and the Buddha jewel, the mind of the Buddha, and the realized beings that are part of the community. Excellent. So we have very specific terms in Buddhism. Yeah, that's a beautiful explanation, right? Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's perfect. Yeah. ACI 3. Smart ass. <laughs> you just cut my talking time by 10 minutes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink. Yeah. You're fired today. Yeah. I'm like, you come and sit here. No, no. That was awesome. That was a really beautiful explanation. I don't need to repeat it. Uh, and those... <laughs> Please repeat it. Yeah, cool. Just to make so, sure. Do you want to explain it again? No, no, I really want you to. It was actually beautiful. <laughs> Taking refuge. We all run for refuge. We all... Uh, when we're unhappy, we run towards things that we think are going to make us happy. And when we are happy, we run towards them even more. You know? Some <laughs> and, and all those refuges are temporary. You know, when people break into your house, you run to the police, they can't really help you. When you get sick and your body um, breaks down, you go to the doctor, they, they can only help you for a short time. You know? Ultimately, yeah, you will die. There will be no, none of this, all of us. Yeah, nothing. No, no one holding your hand will save you from it. No one saying just the right thing in your ear will remove the fact that you will be separated from this the precious thing for you. You think you're your body, you know. So we go for refuge all the time from all these sufferings that we experience in life, and ultimately, the Buddhists say the only thing, the only real true refuge is this understanding of emptiness. And then they, they give you three flavors of it, you know? The emptiness, which uh, is the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha being the, the mind of an enlightened being. It's emptiness. The fact that it can't come from a Buddha is exactly what's inside of you right now. Your, your nature, that's what's your Buddha nature means. You have it, your mind has exactly that same blankness as the Buddha mind, and therefore can be experienced as an enlightened mind, just like a Buddha's mind is perceiving their own mind as enlightened. Yeah, the Sangha is all the community of beings, like Geshe, Michael Roach, or if anyone has had the fortune of meeting a, a being who has had this complete realization of that understanding, the highest understanding of reality, and if you can be forced to perceive that they have that wisdom inside of them, like uh, for many of us, or Geshe Michael Roach and some of his teachers, and, and you can't remove that fact from your mind, that's called the Sangha, that's called the community of beings who have touched that realization. The Sangha, Dharma, Dharma, Dharma Sangha. Exactly. I don't know. And the Dharma is the real. <laughs> it's much better than me. Uh, <laughs> and the Dharma is uh, Dharma is existing thing or 
um, a dharma is a thing. The ultimate dharma is that realization of emptiness itself, that wisdom. So ACI 2 covered that in order to get true protection from the suffering of this life, you better figure out in a visceral, experiential way these things, that your mind is empty, that there are beings that actually have that direct experience of how reality works, you know, in the matrix when he stops the bullet, yeah? That there are beings that understand that there are two worlds here, and then you want, they've, they've had that visceral experience, so you want to hang out with them. They can offer you protection because they can teach you how to get there, yeah? And the fact that that's how things occur. So those are real protections because when we'll discover over the next 12 weeks what happens to your mind when this thing passes on. You know, and uh, <coughs> I'll give you the short summary so you don't have to do the whole 12 weeks. Is um, You are only left with the deepest habituations the force responses that your mind has now, they are just habituated, they're not permanent. You've created them unknowingly or knowingly, you don't know. You could forcibly create a habituated response to being that is that of an enlightened being. I, I, I got, um, I was in South America a couple of weeks ago and and, and I got a very wake-up call. I'd, I'd been doing death meditations for a while, and so I thought I was all good with seeing death come and scared and got the realizations, and I've been doing that for a few years, a long time ago, and I thought I had that settled. And in South America, I had, um, I had death come in so close, closer than I'd ever seen. Um, I'm staying with my godmother who's 91 and she got the news that she's her arteries are 90 plus percent blocked to her heart and she doesn't quite understand what that means other than she doesn't get feeling in her legs and arms and that she shivers a lot and so she says oh, I thought I was gonna go happy and I think I'm just gonna be trouble and then she'll go into these violent shakes and it was horrible to see a being you love like that and I, I couldn't do a single thing to stop the inner pain she had. At the same time, I get news that a dear friend of ours had passed away. Um, and then I get the same day, I get the news that um, a friend of mine in Australia gets throat cancer and he's in the hospice, just got moved to the hospice. Mm -hmm. So this, my mind is experiencing death very close, in a very personal and, and um, strong way. And within 24 hours, my throat closes up and I can't breathe, and I can't swallow, and um, I took, I thought I got the flu or something, and I got hospitalized, I got taken to hospital, they put this injection to open up my throat, and I was okay for 24 hours, and then I'm sleeping that night, still in my mind with this idea of death so close. So, um, my godmother shivering in the, in the bed uh, inside the room next to me, and I can't lay down because saliva is coming out of my mouth. And I'm like, this is, this is the human condition. This is going to happen to all of us. This is, uh... And so I was thinking about my friends dying and my godmother about to die. My other friend as well. And I felt uh, sort of selfish thinking about my own mortality. So I thought I'd sit down and meditate. And it's incredible how you stop caring about the things that aren't that important in your life. None, none of the stuff that I'd spent 40 years working towards mattered. Didn't care what position I had in my job. Didn't care the house I bought. Or the only things that mattered is the stuff that flows deep inside of you in your mind the relationships with people, the love and the caring. And then when even that started um, moving away, as my very being was only wanting one more breath, I'm realizing it's closing up more, I can't breathe, saliva's dripping, and I just go into this, what is that thing? 
And the only thing you are left with is these impressions that are popped up out of your consciousness and you don't have a choice about them. You know, you realize how interpreting what closing up means is a certain thing. And interpreting what not being able to breathe the next breath is a certain thing. <coughs> it didn't fill me with fear. It filled me with a kind of uh, sadness for everybody that was going to meet that moment without knowing that it was somehow an inner projection. And then I thought, I better act, otherwise I won't be able to tell that story. So I went again to the hospital and that fixed me up. Yeah. That's the only thing we, we are left with, our minds, and the way the mind perceives your world. And you can train it to perceive nothing but beauty as that transition of this experience we call life moves. Or you can ignore it right up until the very end and totally freak out and go, what the thing happened? Or you can get obsessed by it and go really dark and that, that's also what you'll habituate. There's nothing in that experience of dying that from its own side causes deep suffering. It can, it can, it can uh, be used to force deep realizations. But the fact is that this the physical thing, which is not the mental thing, uh, must finish. And I thought I, I was prepared. I wasn't quite as prepared as I thought. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. We're going to talk about what happens to, to our minds post that. Because it's an important subject, especially for Westerners. Um, we should know what to do when that comes. So go uh, outside, have some food and some drink, get to know each other, challenge you to know each other. I need volunteers to manage the class. So we have a volunteer to Ustream. We'll tell you later when we come back from the break how the Ustream works. In other words, this is uh, being broadcast to a whole bunch of people who can't be here. And for those of people who can't come one night or the other, they can watch it and do the homeworks and quizzes. So that's Peter. Mm -hmm. Everybody say hi to Peter. Hi, hi Peter. Peter. Then I need volunteers for social media, volunteers for managing the space, volunteers for homeworks and quizzes, and uh, the course materials. So I just need three volunteers who will probably be here every week to make sure they make the class experience magnificent for all of you. I'll see you at quarter to nine. <coughs> I love you all. Really, really nice. Uh, you thought it was going to be a fun class, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I made it depressing. Thank you. Okay, come back in 15. You're killing us.